of us, uh, there is an articulated bony pelvis without any uh, musculature or ligaments or anything attached to it. And uh, we call it the pelvic girdle because it looks like a, a belt. It's the one region which is attaching the appendicular skeleton of the lower limb to the axial skeleton here. Because this in, our, uh, in front of us is the uh, lumbar vertebral column and this is the sacral region. Okay, so what I want to show you at this stage is the tilt, the way pelvic girdle has been placed or positioned in our body. It's like if you look at these two prominent spots, this is the anterior superior iliac spine, the part of the hip bone, and the other is the uh, symphysis pubis, it's this center part. So the, the anterior superior iliac spine is vertically, almost vertical to the, uh, the horizontal plane of our body, okay? So it should be, and, and the, the anterior superior iliac spine and the symphysis pubis should be aligned in a vertical plane. This is how the pelvic, the pelvic girdle has been positioned in our body. And this is, uh, if we say that it's the continuation of the abdominal cavity, the, if I say that the pelvic cavity is a continuation, a downward continuation of the abdominal cavity. And we will talk about uh, the individual bones which are forming the pelvic girdle. And uh, then we will talk about the pelvic, uh, the bony, bony pelvis itself. So in front of you, I'm holding an articulated pelvic girdle. That's the bony pelvis. And I'm holding it in the normal anatomical position with a tilt of 60 degrees, okay? So the pelvic cavity is actually showing. And the two iliac bones are flaring up sideways, okay? So this is the anterior, the, the part which is facing the camera is the anterior view of the pelvic cavity or the pelvic girdle. And the part which is facing me is the post posterior view or the back or the dorsal view of the pelvic girdle, okay? As I have mentioned before, that the, pos the posterior part has been formed mainly by the, the sacrum and coccyx. And the sides are formed by the two innominate bones. They are also known as hip bones. So I'm holding, my hands are clasping over the hip bones, right and left hip bones, okay? The hip bone, like now I'm going to turn the model to show you the hip bone because hip bone is a complex bone. It's the blend or amalgam of three individual small irregular shaped bones. So in the intrauterine life, they developed as three separate bones, okay? All right, so this is in front of us is the hip bone. It's the right hip bone, and I'm showing it sideways, okay? So the, this depression, a deep depression, that's known as acetabular fossa, it's in view, okay? So the hip bone, it's been formed by, anteriorly it's formed by pubis or pubic bone. Inferiorly and posteriorly by ischium or ischial bone and laterally and superiorly it's been formed by a flat Chinese fan-shaped bone which is known as ilium. Okay? The pubis, ischium and ilium fuse together in the floor of the acetabular fossa and this fusion gets ossified at the age like about uh, after puberty. Before puberty, the children have their, uh, the, the joints between the pubis, ischium, and ilium, they are unossified, and they're present as Y-shaped suture in the floor of the acetabular fossa, okay? Now I will take individual bones, the pubic or the pubis bone. You can see, that it's an irregular bone, 
with a body that is in the center. So I have a right pubic bone and a left pubic bone. And they join each other in the midline. And that's that region is, is a secondary cartilaginous joint because it's having a cartilage bar, a highline cartilage bar. And that's, that, that joint is a special joint. It's known as symphysis. Okay, this, this region is known as symphysis pubis, where the right and left pubic bones join each other. Okay, we'll talk about this joint later on. So the body of pubis, and the pubis has a superior arm and an inferior arm. So the superior arm of pubis, or the superior pubic ramus, arm is like ramus. So the superior pubic ramus is joining a ramus which is descending down from the iliac bone. So this together they form the iliopubic ramus. Okay? And this down there, the inferior arm is joining or shaking hands with an arm from the ischium, the posterior inferior bone. So that is forming the ischiopubic ramus. Ischiopubic ramus. Okay? These ischiopubic and iliopubic rami are closing, uh, they are enclosing a cavity or like a, an opening, which is pretty big. This opening is known as the obturator foramen. Okay? Now we will talk about the obturator foramen in detail later on. So, if we look here at the top of the pubic bones, these are there are little elevations, there are little bumps, bony bumps. We call them pubic tubercles. And they are very palpable, like over the skin we can palpate the pubic tubercles and that's a landmark. They provide us a landmark for many things. All right, then I will talk about the ischium. This bone is the sturdiest of all three because this is the region where we sit. So these are the bones on which we put all the, the weight of our torso, the ischial tuberosities. This is a tuberous bone, the body of ischium. It's like a big tuberosity, like a big, like a small mountain, okay? It's very, very tough and hard bone. And this is the, the ramus of the ischium, which was making the ischiopubic ramus, ischial tuberosity. And then here we can see there is a small projection, which is usually very, very pointy, like a spine. So we call it the ischial spine, okay? The ischial spine, ischial tuberosity, ischial pubic ramus, and ischial spine. Then if we come up, this is the ilium, the biggest the, and the flattest part of the hip bone. This, is, this bone is like a Chinese fern. And if we look from front or from anterior, this region, this depression on each side is known as the iliac fossa. So right iliac fossa and the left iliac fossa. And technically speaking, the right and left iliac fossae, they're making the posterior, posterior wall of the lower abdomen, okay? So they are the part of the abdominal wall, posterior abdominal wall. Anteriorly, the anterior abdominal wall is all muscular and fibrous. And laterally and posteriorly it's bony that has been formed by the right and left iliac bones and i'm ending up here at a bump that is the anterior because it's anterior superior because it's on the top iliac spine anterior superior iliac spine gives attachment to a ligament which is very important that's the inguinal ligament and we'll be talking about that ligament later on anterior superior iliac spine can also be felt from the surface and it gives a landmark it is a landmark for the surgeons and physicians just like the pubic tubercles Okay, so our inguinal ligament is, give, is giving attachment like this. So the upper end of my brush is at the il, anterior superior iliac spine, and the lower end is at the cubic tubercle. Okay.
anterior superior spine, if I continue my brush down, you can see there is another bump that is the anterior inferior iliac spine. So we have anterior superior and anterior inferior iliac spines. Then we go on top, that is the iliac crest. It's beveled. It provides attachment to many posterior abdominal wall muscles. So it's rough and it's broad, right? And now if I move the hip bone posteriorly, and I'm showing you the back part of the hip bone, the sideways. So this is the region which has been covered by the gluteal muscles or the buttock muscles, okay? So this is the gluteal surface of the iliac bone or ilium. Here you can see if, if I, you know, follow the anterior superior iliac spine and I'm coming backward, this is the posterior superior iliac spine at the same level. This is the posterior inferior iliac spine at the level of anterior, anterior inferior iliac spine, okay? If I follow down the, down the anterior posterior inferior iliac spine, I will end up rolling my brush in a very deep notch a very big and deep notch. This is the greater sciatic notch. And it, it holds a very uh, big significance. We'll be talking about it. The, post the uh, greater sciatic notch is ended at the level of ischialis spine, because this is ischium. Below the ischialis spine till the ischial tuberosity, we have the lesser sciatic notch, because you, you can compare the sizes. This is huge as compared to this one. So we have two notches, greater sciatic notch above the iliac spine, uh, ischial spine and lesser sciatic notch, which is below the ischial spine, okay? So we will be talking about these notches, which they are not like notches in a live state. When we are alive, they, are, they get converted into foramen by the two very strong ligaments, which are holding our hip bone and the sacrum together, okay? So we'll talk about it in just a few minutes. So that completes our innominate bone or the hip bone, which is a mixture or the blend of three independent bones. They join each other and fuse together, get, get ossified after puberty, okay? That makes the lateral walls of my pelvic girdle. Now, what about the posterior wall? This this bone is the last part of the vertebral column because it's present in the midline, and you can see that this is like it's a fusion of five individual bones or the the vertebrae the the sacral vertebrae and the four coccygeal vertebrae okay so together this they are forming the sacrum and coccyx now i will explain sacrum the bony features of sacrum and coccyx in detail, just like I have explained the hip bone to you. Okay, so in front of you is the sacrum and the coccyx. These are the terminal parts or terminal elements of our vertebral column. And they, this actually this part or the coccyx is at times known as the tailbone because in animals, this bone is, is much more longer and you know, forms the tail, but in, in human beings, it just stays rudimentary. Okay, so the sacrum is, is an amalgam of five sacral vertebrae fused together. So if you, if you look at the top part, because this is the fifth, fifth lumbar vertebra, the, the intervertebral inter disc between the L5 and S1 is indicating a protrusion, okay? This part or the, the, the part of the first sacral vertebra that is protruding anteriorward in front is known as promontory, sacral promontory. It's present in the midline, okay? The prominent spot of sacrum where from where the sacrum is beginning. Then we have, if you look at this, they're like wings on the sides of the promontory. So they are known as the LA, the right LA of sacrum and the left LA of sacrum because LA means a wing, okay? So these are the wings of sacrum. 
After LA, we have these, the, like these are the central parts of the bodies of the sacral vertebrae, which are fused together. So you can't see any an intervertebral disc intervening. And uh, here, these, these regions are known as the lateral masses, the lateral masses of sacrum. And they are showing you the foramina. So there are five foramina showing the emergence of individual ventral rami or the anterior rami of spinal nerves, because this is the anterior surface or the ventral surface of sacrum. In females, uh, the, the position of the sacrum is like this. It's like moving backward and upward, slightly moving upward and backward. It's been placed that way to create more space. And the coccyx, the tip of the coccyx is also backwardly placed in females. But in males, it's forward because there is no need to have enough room for the uh, pelvic cavity. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to, to, to show you the posterior or the dorsal surface of the sacrum. Here we are. So again, the, this is the last lumbar vertebral spine, spine of L5. And now you can see that how these masses or these bodies and the spines of sacral vertebrae are fused together in the midline creating like, you know, a, 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 like a continuous bone, okay? These are the dorsal foramina, sacral foramina for the dorsal rami of the spinal nerves, sacral spinal nerves. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about the pelvic inlet or in other words, pelvic brim, okay? Because we have to establish our understanding towards the true pelvis and the false pelvis. So for that, we have to know what do we mean by pelvic brim, and this is actually creating a limit to the false pelvis and the true pelvis. So I'll start from posterior. Posteriorly, it's bounded by the, the sacrum, the, the promontory of sacrum in the midline, the ala of sacrum on each side, the sacral, sacroiliac joints on each side and then I'm running my brush to the iliopectineal line or the arcuate line okay because it's like an arc so the right and left arcuate lines or iliopectineal lines and in front the pubic crests on each side and the symphysis pubis in the midline. So I'm going to say it again. From posterior, midline, it's the sacral promontory or promontory, the ella of sacrum, sacroiliac joint, the arcuate line or iliopectineal line, pubic crest, and symphysis pubis. Okay, this is how this brim or the outline of pelvis has been formed. It's known as pelvic inlet because the structures are going into pelvis from the abdominal cavity. If there is an inlet, there has to be an outlet, okay? So I'm going to flip this pelvic girdle to show you the outlet. This is the pelvic outlet. And you can see there are so many bones which are irregular in shape, I'm going to complete the pelvic outlet. These two pens, they are the two ligaments, the sacrotuberous ligaments, the right and left sacrotuberous ligaments, they are completing a roughly diamond-shaped pelvic outlet, which is pretty much irregular as compared to the pelvic inlet. And it has a lot of bony structures present. So I'm going to, to describe the pelvic outlet. Anterior, which is facing the the, uh, the table. Anteriorly, it's the symphysis pubis, the bodies of pubic bones, the ischiopubic rami, anterolateral. Yeah. The posterolateral boundings are formed by the right and left sacrotuberous ligaments. And in the midline, at posteriorly, it's the tip of the coccyx. So I'm doing it again, posterior to anterior, 
tip of the coccyx in the midline, the right and left sacrotuberous ligaments, the ischial tuberosities, the ischiopubic rami, and the symphysis pubis. Together, they complete this roughly diamond-shaped opening, which is pelvic outlet. Okay, we have to keep in mind that the outlet is is irregular as compared to the inlet. Okay, so uh, these two hip bones, right and left, and the sacrum in the middle, together they form the pelvic girdle. And how they are forming it? With the help of joints, and they are very strong joints of our body. Okay, because the the entire weight of the body has been transmitted to this pelvic girdle. Okay? In front of us is a model which is showing other structures also, some soft structures. So please don't pay attention to those structures at this moment. Just focus on the bones, the joints, and the ligament. So on this side, you can see there is no ligamentous attachment, but on this side, we can see these gray colored structures, the bands, which are the ligaments. All right, so the pelvic girdle has been, or the pelvic uh, cavity has been formed by three joints. A single joint in the midline is the symphysis pubis that has been formed, at, it's the secondary cartilaginous joint, it's been formed between the right and left pubic bones. It, it has an ability to get loosened up a little bit in the last stages of pregnancy. Then we have the two joints on each side at the back. So these are the sacroiliac joints, and they are the strongest joints of our body. And they are relatively immobile. They are partly synovial, plain synovial type of joints. A very minimum amount of movement is allowed on these joints. And these joints are supported, especially the sacroiliac joints, are supported by some strong ligaments. And I'm going to rotate the model in front of you so that you can have a look at the ligaments. So in front of us, there is a like roughly triangular ligament which is or it's it's attaching at the, the lateral border of sacrum and coccyx and that the base of the of the ligament the broader part of the ligament is attached to the the sides of the sacrum and it's moving on and attaches to the ischial tuberosity so the tapering end of the ligament is attached over the uh, ischial tuberosity. So we call it sacrotuberous ligament. It's one of the strongest ligaments of the body. Underneath the sacrotuberous ligament, you can see another triangular ligament, which is not very much visible, but you can see. You can differentiate between the sacrotuberous. And this one is mainly it's attaching at the sides of the coccyx and the lower part of the sacrum and the tapered end of this ligament is going and attaching on the spine of ischium. So this is known as sacrospinous ligament, okay? So we have two major ligaments supporting the sacroiliac joints and supporting the pelvic girdle from behind all the time, sacrotuberous and sacrospinous ligaments. Both these ligaments are giving attachment over this ischium bone, which is the strongest element of the hip bone, okay? And by the way, uh, as we were talking about the or sciatic notches over here, the greater sciatic notch and the lesser sciatic notch. So if you look here where the ligamentous attachment is there, you can see that the sacrotuberous ligament and the sacrospinous ligaments, when a person is alive, these ligaments are converting these notches into foramina. So greater sciatic foramen, which is having a big muscle, uh, we'll talk about it later, the greater sciatic foramen and the lesser sciatic foramen, again holding muscle tendon and nerve and vessels. Okay, so then we have a ligament on each side which is attaching the ilium with the sacrum, so sacroiliac ligaments. So we have sacrotuberous, sacrospinous, and sacroiliac ligaments covering the, the posterior aspect of the pelvic girdle all around. There is another ligament which is not fulfilling the purpose of a ligament, but it is known as a ligament because it's a, it's a connective tissue uh, band. 
So here it's, or it's giving attachment to the anterior superior iliacus spine and the lower attachment is over the pubic tubercle. So this is the inguinal ligament. It's demarcating the junction between the lower limb or the thigh and the trunk or the pelvic girdle. So this, is, this region is commonly known as the inguinal region, okay? So inguinal ligament uh, is attached over the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle. And it allows, the, it has a gap, it, which allows the passage of nerves and vessels to and from the pelvic cavity. Other than the ligaments, we have another structure, which is membranous. It's the obturator membrane that is closing down the obturator foramen, which is one of the largest foramina of the body. So here you can see this membrane is completely, completely filling up the gap or the opening, except for one spot where there are structures that are coming out of the pelvic cavity and entering the lower limb. So that these are the nerves and vessels. Okay? So the, this, this region is known as obturator uh, canal. Okay, which is a, a gap in the obturator membrane. The obturator membrane is like, like felt. It's, it's very soft uh, uh, structure, uh, which is filling out or filling up all the, uh, the, the opening of the obturator frame. So before moving on to uh, the greater pelvis and the lesser pelvis, I just want to elaborate upon a point which is very important, that there is a difference in the pelvic girdles of male and female. So the males, they have, a, like in general, they have a sturdy and heavy skeleton. So it's more, you know, it's like a broad and uh, heavy as compared to females. That's one thing that's different uh, in the pelvic girdle of a male and uh, like a female. And the other thing is the shape of the pelvic inlet or the pelvic brim. In males, the pelvic brim is roughly, it's, it's usually heart shape or uh, like a closed circle. It's narrow, okay? And uh, the ischial spines, which are not visible in this model, but we can see that the ischial spines are facing more inward, like for more medially, as compared to females. And the other thing is about the subpubic arch, which is this one. It's below the pubic symphysis, so we call it subpubic arch. So the subpubic arch in male is, is narrow and it's sharp in angle, like this, like a gothic arch, okay, in males. Now in females, I don't, I'm, I'm not holding a female pelvis, by the way, in my hand, so I will just explain it to you, that the female pelvis, the transverse diameter of the female pelvic inlet is broader as, or wider as compared to the male. So usually the female pelvis is oval, transversely oval in shape to accommodate the head of the fetus, okay? To increase the depth and the space of the pelvic cavity, true pelvic cavity, the, the ischial spines are effacing. They are laterally uh, placed as compared to female, uh, males, which are medially facing. So ischial spines are laterally facing in females, okay? Other than that, we have the subpubic arch or angle that's broader in females. It's more blunt, wider, like a Roman arch, right? Like if I do this, this is the subpubic angle of a female. And if I do this, it's the subpubic angle of male. As I told you that the pelvic inlet or the pelvic brim is a demarcating line between the true pelvises, okay? The two pelvises. The, the, the region of the pelvic girdle above the pelvic brim is known as the false pelvis by many people, okay? This region is actually uh, the part or the downward extension of the abdominal cavity. So it's known as the false pelvis. It doesn't hold any pelvic organs. It's just, it's, it's, its contents are mainly the, uh, the lower part of the GI tract, which is like the, the, the coils of the small intestine and the sigmoid colon. These are the, the structures and the mesenteries. They are hanging and they are placed in, in this false pelvis, okay? 
The region which is below the pelvic brim is known as the lesser pelvis. By the way, the, the false pelvis is broad, it's bigger, so they call it the greater pelvis or false pelvis. The region which is below the pelvic brim is the lesser pelvis because it's smaller as compared to this lesser pelvis and it's also known as the true pelvis or true pelvic cavity or obstetrician, obstetrician's pelvis because here is uh, the spot where all the reproduct, reproductive organs are lying and the, the, the organs of urinary system and the reproductive system are placed in this true pelvis. Okay, so if I say that the true pelvis is the space lying between the pelvic inlet and pelvic outlet, so I won't be wrong. So this cavity is known as the true pelvic cavity and it's, it has lateral walls, anterior and lateral walls and the posterior wall, okay? But the funny thing is this true pelvis or the pelvic cavity proper is deficient. Its floor is not there. Neither is the roof. Okay? So there is no floor and no roof. Why? Because we know that there are structures which are coming down into the pelvic cavity from the abdominal cavity. So they need us, they need a door. So there is no roof. There are structures which are climbing up from the pelvic cavity up to the abdominal cavity. So they need a door. And, and there is a fact that uh, the pelvic floor is deficient, like the bony pelvic floor is deficient, and that deficiency has been filled up by uh, muscles and fibrous tissue, which we'll be talking about very soon. Uh, that is the pelvic diaphragm or the pelvic floor. So you just have to remember that the pelvic floor, the bony pelvic floor is missing. And, and that leads to the pelvic outlet and below the pelvic outlet is lying the perineal region. So the true pelvic cavity is the space which is holding all the reproductive organs and, and the lower part of the urinary system uh, within their, this cavity. And uh, it's, it has walls on sides and the floor, the, bo the walls are bony, but, but the floor is deficient, okay? We will start talking about the muscles which are making the walls of the pelvis and the muscles which are making the floor of the pelvis to complete the pelvic cavity, okay? So first we'll talk about the muscles which are making the walls. So there are two muscles which are not true pelvic muscles. They don't have any role in, in, in the pelvis. They are the muscles of the lower limb and they are two in number. One is this as the obturator internus muscle. As you can see, this is the obturator opening or obturator foramen. And remember, it was filled with the membrane, the obturator membrane. So from the inner lining or the inner surface of the obturator membrane, the obturator internus muscle is originating. Because on the outside, the outer surface of the obturator membrane gives origin to a muscle which is known as obturator externus. So we are not concerned with the muscle obturator externus. Our concern is with the obturator internus at this moment because we are describing the pelvic cavity. So the obturator internus is like, a, again, it's a sort of a fan-shaped muscle. It takes origin from the almost the entire inner surface of the membrane of the obturate, uh, obturator membrane and also from the bony margins of the, of the obturator foramen. Okay, this muscle, after taking origin, it just, it just uh, con gets, you know, converged and, and forms a tendon which is not visible over here in this model, but we have to imagine that the tendon of the obturator internus will be passing through an opening which was the lesser sciatic notch. So this is the tendon of obturator internus that is passing through the lesser sciatic notch. Remember that uh, this ischial spine, below the ischial spine is the lesser sciatic notch. And I should say the lesser sciatic foramen because at this moment we are talking about the live specimen. So this is the sacral tuberous and sacral spinous ligaments the microbe is representing. And the obturator internus tendon is emerging out from the pelvic cavity into the the, uh, the thigh region, okay? So if I give you the orientation, 
it's something like this. This is the medial, like if imagine my hand is the thigh. So the medial aspect of the thigh. This is the obturator compartment of the thigh. Okay, so the obturator internus originating from the obturator membrane and the borders, the bony borders of the obturator foramen form a tendon and the tendon passes through the lesser sciatic foramen and, and gets uh, or gives attachment to the greater trochanter of femur. It's basically the lateral rotator of femur at hip joint. It has nothing to do with the pelvic structures. Okay. Then the other muscle which is making the wall of the pelvic cavity is this muscle which is hidden in this model is hidden. It's lying underneath this plexus of nerves, which is the sacral plexus of nerves. That is the muscle which is like a roughly a pyramid shaped muscle that's taking origin from the bodies of the, uh, the anterior surface of sacrum, the lateral masses of sacrum on either side, like in the form of three slips the piriformis muscle, because it's like a pyramid, so we call it a piriformis muscle. This piriformis muscle, I will move the model on this side so you can see, you can observe the muscle. This, imagine that like you have to picture in your mind, this is the gluteal region or the region of the back of thigh, okay? So the piriformis muscle emerges through the greater sciatic foramen, okay? It's originating, from the anterior surface of the sacrum on each side. It's roughly pyramidal in shape, so we call it the pyramid piriformis. This muscle, again, just like the obturator internus, is giving, like it's forming a tendon, and that tendon would be giving insertion over the greater trochanter of femur. That is also, like this muscle is also a lateral rotator of femur at hip joint. So it has nothing to do with, uh, with the pelvis. But what it is doing, it has a significance. What it is doing, it's dividing the greater sciatic foramen into an upper compartment, which is lying above the superior border of the piriformis muscle, and a lower compartment, which you can see over here, which is lying below the inferior border of piriformis muscle. So the piriformis, while passing through the greater sciatic foramen, it's dividing the foramen into an upper compartment for the passage of nerves and vessels and into a lower compartment for the passage of nerve and vessels, okay? And another significant feature is on top of or on the inner surface or uh, the pelvic surface of the piriformis is lying the sacral plexus on either side. That's the significance of piriformis muscle. These two muscles make the lateral walls of the pelvic cavity or true pelvic cavity, okay? Now we will talk, we'll move on to the floor or the fibromuscular floor of the pelvic cavity. So uh, when we talk about the pelvic floor, you can see over here in this model that this floor is not like, a, like something which is a straight. It's actually like a, like a hammock or like a gutter, it's, it's of the shape of a gutter, a deep gutter, muscular gutter, okay? Because it is responsible for holding all the, uh, holding up all the reproductive and the urinary system structures, okay? So the pelvic floor is like a, a, a funnel shaped or a gutter shaped a structure made up of muscles. And these muscles together are known as levator and eye muscles. And uh, they are like, they are morphologic, morphologically, they are one entity. So I will be talking about each muscle, like each element of levator and eye, okay? But before that, like in many books, it has been mentioned that the floor of the pelvis has been formed by two muscles. One is coccygeus, which you can see here, like up here, uh, which is deficient, but uh, yeah, this this is here. Like this this thing is coccygeus muscle, and the rest of the uh, the floor, anteriorly, medially, uh, laterally, and anteriorly, is being formed by levator and eye muscle. So when I will describe the two muscles. I will elaborate upon it, but you have to remember that the, the ball has been formed by two muscles, which are the muscles of the lower limb, and the, the floor has been formed by two muscles. They are actually the true muscles, the true, the actual muscles of the pelvic cavity, which are making a gutter shape or hammock shaped uh, floor. 